We wait for the Lord with longing. We put our hope in his word. Our souls wait for the Lord more eagerly than watchmen wait for the morning. We sing the hymn number 474, number 474, Hail to the Lord's anointed, great David's greater son. Let us pray. God of eternity, when the voice of the prophet was silent 
and the faith of your people was low, when the darkness had blotted out the light and indifference had displaced enthusiasm, you saw that the time was right and prepared to send your Son. Set us free from fear and faithlessness that we may be ready to welcome him who comes as Saviour and Lord. Lord Jesus, preaching good news to the people, proclaiming release to the captives, setting free those who were in prison, we adore you. Lord Jesus, friend of the outcast and the poor, feeder of the hungry, healer of the sick, we adore you. Lord Jesus, pattern of gentleness, teacher of holiness, prophet of the kingdom of God, we adore you. Lord Jesus, we come to you to tell you that we are sorry for all that we have done wrong. We ask you to forgive us for the times we have been disobedient and for the times we have hurt you and other people. As we look forward to Christmas, help us to be real channels of your grace and your love for a waiting and a needy world in all the days to come. We ask these prayers in your name, and now we pray in your words. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. So we have reached the third Sunday of Advent. We have two candles already glowing, and we now light our third candle. It's like the children would say, only one more Sunday until Christmas. So here's, whoops, candle number three. And now we're going to sing a real Christmas carol. It's number 305 in the bleak midwinter. Thank you. 
now let us hear the word of God. Our first reading comes from the prophecy of Malachi at chapter 3, beginning to read at verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. Our New Testament reading comes from the Gospel of St. Luke at chapter 3, beginning to read at the first verse. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, and Herod, being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Thanks be to God. Now, there was a little mix-up during the week, and uh, I didn't realize that the choir were going to be here today, but they are here, and they're all ready to sing for us, and they're going to sing, And the Glory of the Lord from Messiah.
Now may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Earlier in this season of Advent, we thought about a very dead-looking stick in a pot that, because it was nurtured and cared for, has now become a small and very healthy tree. And you will remember that I spoke about the swelling buds that had gradually appeared on the stick and that eventually became small shoots of new life. And I told you that these have now developed into branches that actually needed to be thinned out. Earlier this week, I was in the garden centre where they were selling off bulbs, bulbs that were past their sell-by date, believe it or not, but bulbs that would be perfectly uh, able to grow. They looked very dead. But I was well aware that if we were to plant them, they would disappear under the ground, but would come to life. We all know from experience that inside every bulb is all the potential for new life, life which can come to fruition in the spring. And we all know that in both cases, the promise of new life is always present, waiting for the sun and the warmth of the spring to wake it from its winter slumber. What a striking illustration nature is in this season of Advent, even in a year such as this, when so many are suffering because of the violence of the weather and all the other things that have been going on in our world. The fact is that all the works of nature contain both an ending and a beginning within themselves. In the stick, in the pot, all looked to be dead, but the potential for life was there. And when spring came, it showed itself in the new green shoots of life. And the bulbs, even those past their sell-by date, will disappear almost completely under the ground, to all intents and purposes dead to the world. Yet within a few weeks or months, there will be brave spikes of new life in the frost-hardened soil. And before long, gardens and hedgerows will be filled with seas of beautiful yellow daffodils and later on pink lilies as the promise of new life shows itself in all its glory. Death and out of death, life. A perfect illustration of the theme of Advent with its notes of earnest warning and joyful expectation sounding together. The Lord Almighty says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. So the prophet Malachi, together with other prophets, tell the people of God. The doctrine of the messenger, or the forerunner, was always a fixed part of the messianic hopes of Israel. Whether it was part of a prophetic expectation or an established fact of history recorded in the Gospels, the place of the forerunner or messenger in the religious history of the world is one which has long been well recognized. It is a fact that in nature, spring will not come until the right preparations have been made. As nature takes its course, it is the warmth of the sun which breaks the frost and allows the earth to bring forth its fruit. If we look back through history, we quickly see that many reformers and pioneers have failed in what they set out to do, 
not because what they intended was wrong, but simply because the ground of opportunity had not been properly prepared before them. They had not had the right forerunners, the right messengers to prepare the way for them. In the history of our own church, the Protestant Reformation did not begin with Luther's nailing of 95 theses on the door of the church, or even with Knox's sermon in St. Andrews, for, those, for these and what followed were the result of what had been happening in the world and in the church for at least 200 years before the great event. And the ordination and induction of a new minister is not a single event set on an arbitrary date appointed by the presbytery, but rather the result of years of prayer and preparation. In fact, it is the beginning of a new relationship which springs from the groundwork that has been done before the event. In every sense, we are all a product of what has gone before. And at the same time, we ourselves are preparing the ground for those who will come after us. In this season of the church's year, the readings and reflections and prayers of our worship are calling all of us to cast off all that is dry and dead in our lives as Christians and calling all of us to wait in simple trust for the coming of Christ at Christmas. And in his coming, he brings us the promise of grace and renewal, new life in Christ. So, as we wait, we are sharing in the experience of those who, long before his nativity, yearned for his coming and prepared for it by their words and deeds, as did the Old Testament prophets. They march through the history of the people of God like so many sandwich board men, bearing placards, announcing a forthcoming great occasion. Each of the prophets has a different style, yet all of them are pointing towards the same event, the messianic hope, the birth of the Savior, the Word made flesh. Perhaps the most arresting of all these prophetic figures is actually to be found in the New Testament, in the person of John the Baptist. He stands between two ages, a bridge between the old covenant and the new, embracing by his life and witness the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the new. He points, like all those who had gone before him, to a saviour who is yet to come. But he is to be distinguished from the others because for them, the coming was only a distant prospect, whilst for him, it was imminent. The fact that preparation was needed before any sort of change could come, the fact that the prophets, and especially John the Baptist, had a very real role in the preparation for the coming of the Saviour, is not without relevance for today's world. It was the fashion in the years before the First World War to assume that the social gospel was so far advanced that our Western world was well within sight of the Christian utopian order which was its goal. Yet with hindsight, we can see that this was not the case. This expectation was based on a superficial idea of our culture and what it meant by Christian living. And it failed to take account of the deep-rooted moral questions which such a superficial lifestyle failed to address. The establishment of a truly Christian way of life needs much deeper spade work than our Victorian forefathers were prepared to put into it. And so, 
Instead of living in a truly Christian country, we are now facing disillusionment with the church on the part of so many who are now outside it, and even some who are within it. And so our messianic hope is having to be postponed. But that postponement is really an indication of our, of our part in the work to be done in the prophetic service of the Christian cause. It is our task as Christians to be the forerunners, the messengers of the coming of the kingdom of God. It is not for us to give up and go home saying that it's not worth the effort. It is the missionary task of each and every one of us to bring others to God, to prepare the way in our own sphere of influence for the coming of his kingdom. That must seem like a tall order at the best of times and a dreadful uphill struggle in today's world. But we have to keep in our hearts the certainty that within what seems to be dead, there is always new life. There is a Persian proverb that says, a place where the sun always shines is a desert. The same could be said of the Christian faith. It is easy to hold fast to the faith when life is easy, everything is going our way, and we live in the sunshine of certainty. But when that sort of faith is put to the test, it often breaks under the strain. It is when we wrestle with the darkness of doubt and difficulty, fear and despair, that we learn that real faith is refined and purified and strengthened by the struggle. The story of John the Baptist testifies to the truth that a real faith inevitably contains some element of doubt. Having announced with burning conviction the imminence of Christ's coming, John found himself cut off physically from the sunlight of, of a free life and ensnared in the darkness of Herod's prison. And while he was there, he was besieged by doubt, so much so that he had to send helpers to find out whether Jesus really was the Messiah for whom he had been preparing the way. And the helpers came back, not with some great blinding revelation, but with a factual account of the healing activities of Jesus of Nazareth, actions which could do nothing other than point to the living presence of God. Advent is a season which reminds us of the way in which God can come to us in our darkest times. Every religious change, both in a person and in a society, begins with an instinctive moral reform. This is then followed by reflection and then by reformation of faith and practice. And then finally, there is the beautification of the trappings of religion as new ways of doing things develop. And it's here that the danger lies. For these things can become an end in themselves, and we can begin to forget what the Christian life should really be about. So although reform is needed, there is every reason why we should think hard about our theology and should enrich our worship in every way that we can but never let these preoccupations get in the way of a genuine Christian living. There are times when our anxieties and uncertainties cling to us like dead leaves and we fail to see the evidence of new growth. Indeed, we are sometimes so tied up in tradition that we want to ignore the new growth altogether. We have our doubts as to whether the growth we see is the right way forward, whether our faith is really being refined and strengthened, 
or whether it is simply being superficially decorated. At these times of darkness, we are sharing with women and men throughout history who have, like John the Baptist in his prison cell, wondered whether they have really been moving towards the promised kingdom of God. But John's friends were able to reassure him that somewhere God's sunlight of love and forgiveness was still shining in the world and in the person of Christ and in the eternal presence of the Holy Spirit. That is true for us too. The kingdom of God, which the prophets and John the Baptist proclaimed with such vigor, has already come. That is an evergreen fact, which we shall celebrate again this Christmas. And even when our own faith seems brown and dead, we can reflect on John's experience in that prison cell and can know that whatever happens to us and however we are feeling, our faith is still being refined and strengthened if we will allow it to happen. And we can be certain that whatever situation in which we find ourselves, we can never be deprived of the love of God in the person of Jesus Christ, our Saviour, God with us. Amen. And now as we think of our offering, let us pray. Accept, O Lord, the offerings we seek to make of ourselves and our money, and grant that we may ever work and pray to build a world of peace and joy and freedom, a world where everyone will have what they need. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We join together to sing the hymn number 303. Number 303, it came upon the midnight clear, that glorious song of old. We. 
And now let us make our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. Let us pray. God of all the world, as we prepare for the great festival of Christmas, we come to you with joy as we give thanks for all that you have done to change our lives and make them more pleasing to you. We come to you with thanks as we stand alongside those who are seeking to change the world for good, for we would want to support them in every way we can. We come to you in prayer and offer ourselves in love and service to your people who are in need at this time. May all that we do in the days to come be pleasing to you and helpful to those around us. Emmanuel, humanity waits in darkness, longing for your light and looking forward with hope and with vision. O God of this and every nation, we bring to you the needs of the world. Where there is fear, come with your peace. Where there is injustice, come with your righteousness. Where there is poverty, come with your mercy. As we think of our world today, we think of so many people who are suffering, but so much want to live in freedom and security. And as we prepare once again to welcome our Saviour at Christmas time, we think of those who live in countries torn apart by war and scarred by natural disaster, who are still unable to live in real peace and security. God, the giver of life and light to the world, we look forward to the day when darkness and death will be no more, the day when the earth will be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. O oh God of this and every church, we bring to you the needs of our community. Where faithful people meet in your name, may it be in unity. Where faithful people work and worship, may all that they do be pleasing to you. Where your people set out to change the world, may it always be for the good of all people. God, the giver of life, we pray for your blessing on our church and our community. O God of every man and woman and child, our God, we bring to you the needs of those we love. Where people are hurting, bring them your healing. Where people are in difficulty, grant them your courage. Where people are tired, give them your rest. And where people are mourning the loss of those they love, bring to them the comfort of your continuing presence. Loving God, we give you thanks for those who have walked this world before us and have brought with them changes that have been for our good. We pray that you will enable us to follow their example and that when our time on earth is over, that we shall be reunited with those who have been our example and inspiration in the kingdom of your love. Gracious God, we have asked that you will accept our prayers and make all things new in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our closing hymn is the carol number 301. Number 301, Hark the Herald Angels Sing Glory to the Newborn King. Sinners 
into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no man evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you this day and forevermore. <laughs>